Josephine Baker. You knew she was a jazz dancer, but did you know that she was also a spy? That's right, during World War II, she became the 007 of the French Resistance. You expect me to dance? No, Miss Baker. I expect you to die. Today is a showcase episode featuring Chuck and Karen of the podcast Spy Stories, who are going to tell us all about her life, including her adventures as a spy. We're going to see what's shaking not stirred. It's going to be a cabaret royale. You can live and let dance. Jazz finger. All right, enough of that already. Sorry. It's Bond. Jazz Bond. The story of Josephine Baker, today on the history of sex. History of Sex is sponsored by Dr. Jillian Kenny, historian of women, sex, and magic in medieval Europe. Every life is a story. Some are bestsellers. I'm Chuck. I'm Karen. And this is Spy Stories. Who are you going to tell me about today, Karen? Today we learn about Josephine Baker. She was a World War II spy, and this is her story. Frida Josephine McDonald Baker was born June 3, 1906, in St. Louis, Missouri, to washwoman Carrie McDonald and vaudeville drummer Eddie Carson. Shortly after Frida's little brother came into the world, Eddie left the family. Later, Carrie married Arthur Martin, who was said to be a fairly nice guy, but wasn't highly motivated, and he had trouble holding down a job. The family eventually added two more daughters. It is possible that the man usually cited as Frida's father, Eddie Carson, wasn't actually her biological father, Research done by Baker's biographer, who happens to be one of her children, indicates that Josephine's birth father was likely a white man that her mother worked for. Because her family was so poor, Frida followed her mother's footsteps, and she worked as a housemaid to wealthy white families at a very, very tender age. At age eight, Frida was physically abused by an employer who burned her hands after the young girl accidentally added too much soap to the laundry. Baker's biography states that the young girl had to endure quite a bit of physical and emotional abuse, and she made up a fairy tale land in her head to help her dream the truth away. Frida had to walk at least a mile daily from her house to pick up leftover produce from the store and coal for the family. And on the way, she loved to see the street performers that would gather in the corners of her neighborhood. They would delight and inspire her and give her joy in the midst of sorrow. Unfortunately, this time in Baker's life also marked a traumatic event in her community, one that shaped the young girl forever, and that was the St. Louis riots of 1917. Chuck? Yeah, the riots, also known as the East St. Louis Massacre, was just horrific. Now, at this time, racial tensions were already simmering under the surface because the black population had doubled in seven years in East St. Louis. The population surge was due to economic opportunity. Workforce loss due to the war allowed black workers to be employed at factories where those jobs used to not be available to them. Now, this particular event occurred after the mostly white workforce at the Aluminum Ore Company in St. Louis went on strike due to the racial employment changes. The company responded by replacing the hundreds of workers on strike with black workers. Now, as you would imagine, this enraged the white laborers and they took on a mob mentality. When a rumor circulated that a black man had tried to rob a white man at the factory... The kindling that had been building up finally just sparked. Angry mobs took to the streets, and they started beating every black face they could find. Hmm. 
Now, in response, some of the black community organized an armed militia in an attempt to fight back. In the fray, two white policemen were killed, and from that point on, it was just a war. Right. Black residents were jerked out of their homes, even off streetcars and trolleys. Those that tried to huddle in their houses for safety were shot at indiscriminately. Hmm. Homes were set on fire with the occupants being shot as they tried to escape. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was a it bloody was time. Really, really horrific, yeah. Black bodies jumped into the river, some to their death in hopes of escaping the terror and madness surrounding them. Many black people were hunted down and lynched. And this violence, this wasn't a day occurrence. This lasted a long time. The riots began on May 28th. The National Guard was brought in during early June, but they were unable to stop it. Things finally began to quiet down by the middle of July. After the dust settled, somewhere between 40 and 400 people had been killed. Hmm. Every story that you read about this, you get a different number. Right, and that's because it had lasted so long. It stretched out all throughout the city, and they couldn't really define, you know, the people who drowned and the people who were lynched. I mean, it, not everything was attributed to the riots like it should right. have been. Mm -hmm. Right. But there was an estimated 6,000 black people who were displaced from their homes. Gosh. Ugh. Yeah, it, it was truly one of the worst cases of racial violence in modern American history. Right. And following that, there were there was a similar riot in Chicago. Um, right. I think that they called like 1919 Bloody Summer. But yes. even the, the terrible riots in Chicago could weren't as bad as these they riots were in St. Louis. This, yeah. Right. Well, the riots truly shattered the black community that made up young Frida's world. She wasn't even 12 and everything she knew had changed. And it's altogether possible that these events caused a break with the already dreamy little girl that she was never able to fully recover from. With nothing but a fifth grade education, Frida decided to strike out on her own. After what she had witnessed, she just wanted out. Out of her house, out of her community, she just wanted out. And she craved something that felt safe. But what she escaped to was likely worse than what she left. After running away from the family home, a local ice cream shop proprietor, a man in his 50s, a man who had likely offered sweets to the girl on her long daily trips, a man who probably represented safety and happiness and color in a depressingly gray world, this man offered his home to Frida. And we all know that this world is a very ugly place. And what Frida went through while she lived there is likely beyond anything we would ever want to know. After increasing pressure from the community, the ice cream parlor owner did make Frida leave. And then she moved in with her grandparents. But she did that with the express goal of gaining independence and getting out of the area as quickly as possible. So, at 13 years old, she started waitressing as well as supplementing her income by dancing on the street corners for money. Still, only at 13, Frida met and married Willie Wells, a foundry worker in his 20s. The marriage didn't last the year, and this would be the first of several marriages for the young woman. At 15, Frida joined the touring show Shuffle Along, and she eventually found herself in Harlem, New York, at the height of the Harlem Renaissance. Yeah, the Harlem Renaissance is a time period that lasted roughly from 1910 through the 1930s. And it is considered the golden age of African-American culture in regards to literature, drama, music, and art. The northern Manhattan neighborhood of Harlem was designed to be an upper-class white neighborhood, but the area was rapidly overdeveloped and there were many empty buildings that landlords found themselves desperate to fill. Now, there was a middle-class black neighborhood at the time known as Black Bohemia, and they sort of transferred to Harlem. Prominent members of the black community, such as W.E. Du Bois, led what was later known as the Great Migration into Harlem. The culture of Harlem grew 
the literary likes of Langston Hughes and the music genius of Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, Bessie Smith, Fats Waller, and Cab Calloway. Now, Josephine was known at performing at both the Plantation Club and the Cotton Club, which were both rather famous clubs at the time, but she worked the Plantation Club more. There's an interesting tidbit to that, right, Chuck? Yeah. The Plantation Club was a competing venue to the Cotton Club. The Cotton Club was the premier venue for black entertainment for a whites-only audience. Ugh. Well, and it was owned by Oni Madden, who was a gangster, who was a very well-known gangster. The Plantation Club hired Cab Calloway away from the Cotton Club, and Madden sent his goons down to the Plantation Club, where they locked the workers in the basement, tore up the dance floor, broke all of the chandeliers, and threw the bar into the street. Wow. Yeah, apparently the club scene was, was pretty, pretty violent those days. Well, a lot of them were owned by mobsters. Right. The drama surrounding the Harlem club scene kept Frida jumping from place to place. But no matter where she was performing, the Plantation Club, Cotton Club, or anywhere else, audiences loved her blend of improvisational comedy and dance. She ended up touring the United States with the Jones Family Band and the Dixie Steppers. During this period in her life, she married again to a Mr. Willie Baker, who was a porter. This mattered because being a porter was considered a step up on the social ladder. Frida knew what she was doing and what she wanted. A year later, she kept his name, but nothing else, as she decided to move to Paris to see how well she was received there. At this point, Frida started going by Josephine, and her transformation into the icon we all know was nearly complete. In 1925, Frida, now Josephine, used the same style that had garnered her so much attention in New York to make a splash in France. She ended up doubling her income but taking off half her clothes. In Paris, she was known for performing in only a feather skirt or the infamous tiny skirt made only of bananas. What's interesting about that skirt um, you would think that a manager, a man, put that skirt on her and kind of had her do what she did with that. She actually designed a lot of her own choreography, and she designed that skirt. Later, when asked about her risque choices when she was so young, Josephine said, I wasn't really naked. I just wasn't wearing any clothes. Yeah, that usually is not the answer that the police accept. <laughs> I think she was trying to be profound. Oh, okay. Usually doesn't work for men, does it? No, it does not. <laughs> Her rise to fame in Paris was a rapid whirlwind, but Josephine quickly adapted to the extravagant lifestyle. She bought herself a gold piano. She bought herself Marie Antoinette's actual bed. And, of course, she bought a diamond collar for her pet cheetah. Chiquita. Chiquita. Chiquita the, the cheetah, Karen. Go ahead and say it. Chiquita the cheetah. There, Aha, I, love there you go. I love it. And strangely, a club owner gave this to her to use in her stage show. So it was kind of like a used cheetah, like a secondhand cheetah. And Oh, like secondhand lions. Right. Yeah. Yes. We both love that movie. Yes. Kind of a rule of life is if somebody offers you a cheetah, look under the hood really closely because it's probably defective. Well, you, you do realize, I mean, she does never prosper, so. Okay. Okay, let's go. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> I'm sorry. She's got us four bad reviews. <laughs> I didn't say sabotage, though. Not yet. <laughs> Chiquita, the cheetah, was notorious for causing a panic when it would jump into the orchestra pit during performances. And you know why it did that, right? I mean, you know why it would jump into the orchestra pit. Yes? I do not, but you're going to say it. It's because he thought that they were performing cats. I knew that was coming. So. It hurts. Go ahead. <laughs> There's five bad reviews. Keep going. <laughs> People are going to be like, Karen, Karen, stop, just stop. Please. Just, just yeah. stop. <laughs> well, during this time, Josephine was also inundated with suitors pining for her attention. Two of these men actually battled for her attention in a duel. Not just a duel, but a very dramatic duel. 
a duel in a cemetery. Because if you're going to do a duel, you might as well be in a cemetery. In 1928, a Hungarian cavalry officer and an Italian count drew swords and passionately fought for the heart of the young dancer who was watching, sitting atop a tombstone, delighted at the drama unfolding around her. The two men battled it out for about 10 minutes when the cavalry officer struck the count on the shoulder, drawing first blood. Despite the fun of the attention, Josephine didn't want to see anyone actually hurt, so she called for the two to stop fighting and make up. The story was very sensational, and it was also very planned. The Italian count was actually Josephine's manager, her promoter, financial and creative advisor, and lover, Papito Abatino. Although Papito claimed in the press to be from an aristocratic background, his background story was not so different than Josephine's. The couple carried on for a while, but they never married. The young dancer and actress's career kept soaring. She became one of the most popular music hall entertainers in France, and a favorite of renowned intellectuals and artists such as Pablo Picasso, E.E. E. Cummings, and Ernest Hemingway. Hemingway said of her, she was the most sensational woman anyone ever saw. To be fair, Hemingway probably said that about a lot of people. He probably did, but I liked it. He was, he was rather dramatic like that. Well, Josephine's rise to fame also gave her the opportunity to star in three motion pictures. She was actually the first African-American woman to star in a feature film. Wanting to build the same type of success in the United States that she enjoyed in France, Baker moved to the U.S. in 1936. Once back in her homeland, Josephine was startled and very discouraged to find her act met with so much hostility and racism that she ended up moving back to France. About 200,000 troops, mostly from the American South, arrived in France for the Great War. The first one. Many of the black GIs decided to stay to escape the racism of America, and many followed them over. Now, soon they introduced jazz to the French, and the French embraced black writers, musicians, and artists in ways that America didn't. And this created a thriving community of black artists until, of course, the Nazi invasion, which disrupted everything. The Nazis ruin everything. They always do. They do. As she reclaimed her fame there, she started making some of her fanciful dreams come true. She bought a fairy tale castle near Perigord, France, and the property, built in 1489, was called Chateau de Milan. And when she first lay eyes on it, the performer called it Sleeping Beauty's Castle. She had to have it. Josephine would spend years working to turn it into her own personal utopia. During this time, she also met and married French billionaire sugar importer Jean Lyon, and she denounced her American citizenship in order to obtain legalization from the country that embraced her. Josephine became a French citizen. But her new country was falling under a shadow. With Nazi occupation imminent, refugees came flooding into Paris. Josephine wanted to help, and she would perform to a massive audience with all the glitz and glamour as usual, and then directly afterwards steal out to join other Red Cross volunteers at local homeless shelters, where she would make beds, bathe seniors, and comfort new refugees. After the actual Nazi occupation, Baker felt that helping was not enough. With her fame came an incredible responsibility— According to some accounts, Baker joined the McKee, a group of guerrilla freedom fighters, but her primary role was that of a seductress who enticed diplomats and generals to confide in her, and as an envoy who carried concealed notes to General Charles de Gaulle's agents in Lisbon. She housed resistance members in arms on her property and also hid many Jewish refugees within the castle as well. Several times she was almost arrested for these transgressions against the Nazi regime, but she always managed to get out of her predicaments with a wink and a smile. 
Josephine Baker obtained her pilot's license in 1933 at the same school where notable black stunt aviator Bessie Coleman received her training, and sources state that Baker herself flew both resistance supplies and members to safety during the war. One day, a man showed up on Josephine's property. Expecting to see a Nazi and preparing herself for deception, she was taken aback by the frank request of the extremely handsome man in front of her. The gentleman was secret agent Jacques Abti, and he had come with a mission. Chuck? Yeah, Abti was the 33-year-old head of French military intelligence. He was looking for an undercover agent willing to work without pay for the French war effort. And his friend suggested Baker. Now, at first, he was hesitant to approach Baker, fearing that she'd end up like Matahari, the flamboyant dancer turned spy who was executed by firing squad after she betrayed the French military that recruited her. Now, for Abdi, there were just too many similarities between the two women, and he did not think Baker was worth the risk. His friend insisted that Baker would be perfect for the job. She traveled a lot, had friends in high places, and hated the Nazis because they reminded her of America's racists. Remember, her childhood had been shaped by that St. Louis riot. Now, eventually, Abti decided to try it, and he traveled to Baker's expansive home. He expected to see a fancy, made-up woman. Instead, he found a 34-year-old Baker walking around the grounds of her estate, wearing old clothes and a crumpled felt hat to shade her eyes. And she was carrying a rusted can full of snails to feed her ducks. <laughs> but later, over glasses of champagne, Abti outlined his mission and the dangers involved. And Baker's reply stunned him. Very dramatically, she said, France made me what I am. I will be grateful forever. The people of Paris have given me everything. They have given me their hearts, and I have given them mine. I am ready, Captain, to give them my life. You can use me as you wish. Impressed with her sincerity and her enthusiasm, Abti hired her on the spot. Now, a secret agent, officially known in the French military as an honorable correspondent, Baker began training with the same energy that she showed in everything else that she did. She learned karate, and she practiced with a pistol. Within just a few weeks, she could shoot out the flame of a candle at 20 yards. After the Germans successfully occupied all of France, Baker knew she couldn't go home again, or she would face arrest and possibly worse. The chance to escape occupied France came when the French resistance leader de Gaulle asked Baker and Abdi to head to the neutral city of Lisbon, of course, Lisbon, so they could send reports to his station in London. Abdi defected from the French army to join de Gaulle's free French movement, and de Gaulle was glad to have him and Baker on board. Baker made travel arrangements under the guise that she was just passing through Lisbon, like they all do. Every spy we have done has ended up in Lisbon. Even like the Civil War spies, they were in Lisbon. <laughs> so before there was Lisbon, the spies were there. Yeah. Well, she was on her way to performances in South America, and she and Abdi had to transport 52 pieces of classified information, a prospect that seemed daunting until they had the brilliant idea to transfer the data to Baker's sheet music using invisible ink. They wrote the top secret information on the pages of Baker's theme song, Two Loves Have I. Baker dressed for the trip in flashy clothing and costly furs, attracting so much attention that Abdi, who was posing as her assistant, was able to lay low and cross international borders without incident. She and Abdi headed to Northern Africa to set up a permanent liaison and transmission center with British intelligence, but it took a miserably long time. The pair finally managed to arrive in Casablanca, Morocco, where they met with free French representatives. Baker toured Morocco, Spain, and Portugal, providing entertainment for enthusiastic audiences and information for the French resistance. The reluctant secret agent and the flamboyant performer began an intense five-year relationship where they did everything together, by day and by night. 
Baker's missions came to a tragic halt when she suffered a miscarriage and had to undergo an emergency hysterectomy. Complications from the surgery actually landed Baker in the hospital for 19 months. Resistance members gathered in her private hospital room to discuss German strategies and troop operations, and they did this at her bedside. For her service during the war, Josephine Baker received the Knight of the Legion of Honor, Holder of the War Cross, the Resistance Medal, and the Free France Medal. After her espionage work, Josephine Baker also made it her mission to entertain French, British, and American troops to help boost their morale, and she would refuse any payment for these lively performances that would have normally made her a pile of cash. Her hope was that when soldiers applauded her, she liked to believe they would never acquire a hatred for a color because of the cheer that she brought them. It was this experience that inspired Baker to finally face the race challenges permeating America. On her second return to the United States, Josephine was not discouraged and depressed by the racism like she was before, but now, due to her extreme success, she saw it for what it was, ignorance and small-mindedness. In Europe and North Africa, Josephine had been honored in the palaces of kings and queens, Yet, in the city where she drew her first breath, she was not allowed to walk into certain hotels to order a cup of coffee, purely based on the shade of her skin. She vowed to fight this intolerance with her life. Josephine Baker decided to do a tour in the United States, but in an effort to fight segregation, she had it written into her contract that any venue that she performed in must let all ticket holders inside, no matter what their race. Although Josephine first assumed most of the racism was concentrated and confined to the South, she found that this wasn't actually the case. When she arrived in New York City with her fourth husband, Joe Bullion, they were refused. In fact, they were refused 36 times because of her race. 36 different hotels. The pattern was repeated all over the country. Even artists like Ella Fitzgerald and Nat King Cole were banned from the best hotels. When Vegas club El Rancho refused to let black ticket holders into her concert, Baker refused to perform. She simply sat on the stage, staring blankly into the crowd, until the owners relented. This act of defiance is credited with helping to desegregate Vegas casinos. Well, after the tour, Josephine wrote about the injustices that she observed, and her thoughts were published in a French newspaper. Her essay outlined the evils of segregation, and she articulated herself so well that in 1963, she was the only official female speaker to speak alongside Martin Luther King at the March on Washington. Baker addressed the crowd while clothed in her French military uniform, and then she paused, taking in the diverse sea of faces looking back at her. Finally, she spoke, almost to herself, and said, Look at all that salt and pepper, just what it should be. After King's assassination, his widow, Coretta Scott King, approached Baker in the Netherlands to ask if she would take her husband's place as leader of the civil rights movement. After many days of mulling it over, Baker declined, saying at the time her children were too young to lose their mother. Another refusal to work unless the audience was desegregated, this time in Miami, led to a columnist noting, at the command of one little brown girl, the walls of segregation came tumbling down. Later, an incident occurred that would follow Joe for years. Yeah, this was the Stork Club incident with Walter Winchell. And to set this up, you have to know about Walter Winchell. He was one of the most powerful and well-connected journalists of his time. He had his own table at the Stork Club where this incident occurred from which he would write gossip columns and news stories. So one night, Josephine Baker arrives with Roger Rico and his wife in 1951. She had just had a really good show closed out at the Roxy, and she was craving shrimp cocktail and a steak. <laughs> now, this is one of the most prestigious supper clubs in the world, and it seemed that that should be the place she should celebrate. 
Well, an hour after she had placed her order, she noticed that everyone else around her was being served, but she was not. Now, what Baker didn't know was that club owner Sherman Billingsley had arranged it that way. When she walked in, Billingsley saw her and said to a waiter who let her in. Now, once she realized what was happening, she called her lawyer, Walter White, who was also the executive secretary of the NAACP. And from the same phone booth, she also called Deputy Police Commissioner Billy Rowe about being denied service. Now, after the phone calls were placed, a waiter rushed over to the table and finally brought out the steak that Baker had ordered, but Baker refused to eat it. She said, I have no intention of suffering deliberate humiliation without striking back. She left the restaurant in a huff, and do you know who she left with? Who? Princess Grace of Monaco. Princess Grace was very... Grace Kelly. She was very offended and said, we shall never come back here again. And Princess Grace was back two months later. Well, <laughs> well at least she was huffy at the moment. Huffy at the moment. It's all that counts. But she left the restaurant and in the press scolded Winchell for not coming to her defense. Now, Winchell felt very, very stung because he had very liberal views on race. But he really resented being called out for this, a situation he claimed he was completely unaware of. And he was also very, very loyal to the store club. So he became angry and wrote some scathing articles about Baker. And in one intimated that she had communist leanings because of past statements she had made about Mussolini. They were kind of ambiguous statements. But this was during the communist scare. So it became a huge deal. It became a huge, huge deal. And Winchell was a huge name. Well, she sued Winchell for defamation, and that suit bounced around for a few years, but was eventually dismissed. But some damage had already been done. The FBI noticed her and started a file on Josephine that today is over 400 pages thick. With rumors swirling about Baker's loyalty to America, she added some fuel to the fire with a tour that she had in South America, where she made statements that were considered politically dangerous at the time, such as, America is not a free country, and blacks there are treated like dogs. During her South American travels, Josephine was amazed by Evita Perón's efforts to help impoverished children in her rainbow tour of 1947. Chuck, do you know anything about that? I do. And no. it, it was in 1947, obviously. Perón traveled to Spain, Italy, and France, and Switzerland. And they dubbed this the Rainbow Tour because they called her the Rainbow Perón. She was the Rainbow of Argentina. Now, her goodwill trip included meetings with Francisco Franco, Pope Pius, and Charles de Gaulle. Ironically dressed to the nines, she gave money to poor children in Spain, (laughs) visited the Palace of Versailles, and encountered protesters, strangely in Switzerland, who threw stones and tomatoes at her. Huh. It doesn't seem very Swiss of them, but... No, that doesn't seem like a place where you would have stones or tomatoes thrown at you. It does not, but... Many Europeans distrusted Perón's fascist rule and his ties to Nazi war criminals. And others disapproved of what they viewed as her ostentatious, and this is a harsh word they used for what she was doing, fame whoring. Ooh, yeah, that's rough. Well, Josephine was inspired by Perón. And Josephine, who could not bear biological children, devised a plan. She wrote to a friend in 1953 saying that she was going to adopt five small boys, one Japanese child, a dark-skinned African, an Indian from Peru, a Nordic, and an Israeli. (sighs) So, Josephine's plans may sound a little ridiculous and idealistic now, but remember, she was a very dreamy, idealistic woman. Her heart's intention here was to raise these five boys as brothers living together as a symbol of democracy. The mental image of children, what you plan to do, and holding a baby in your arms are two very different things, and a mama heart can easily overwrite a pragmatic one 
and Josephine Baker did not find herself with five boys. She found herself with 12 children. All of them were boys except two girls. Each child was raised with a different racial identity, culture, and religion. Baker referred to her family as her rainbow tribe, and she opened up her palatial home to paying customers who wanted to witness the children playing together and living in harmony. Well, as much harmony as you can have when there are 12 siblings. Many critics accused Baker for using her children for what they viewed as a social experiment. And in a way, it was a social experiment. Josephine wanted to create a family that represented a world village united in love. It was a noble goal and true to her idealistic nature, even if real life is never so simple. At this point in her life, Josephine was on her fourth marriage to white band director Joe Bullion. He was close enough to the children that upon their divorce, two of the kids actually went to live with him. One of Baker's sons reflected on his childhood with, We grew up at Chateau Le Milan like a regular family, but the show business part was sometimes tiring. Well, Le Milan was nothing regular, that is for sure. The fairy tale property of Josephine's dreams was basically built up to look like a town. The property included two hotels, three restaurants, a miniature golf course, amusement park type rides, a wax museum of scenes from Josephine's life, a racetrack, stables, a patisserie, a faux gras factory, a fuel station, and a post office. The property was usually open for tourists. They also had kind of a zoo, Chateau de la Milan housed Chiquita the cheetah, Toot Toot the goat, Albert the pig, who always smelled of expensive perfume and who was allowed to walk the house freely, eventually getting so large the doorways had to be removed to accommodate him. There was also a chimpanzee, a snake, a parrot, fish, three cats, seven dogs, and a multitude of ducks. The extravagance of the family home was not something that Bullion wanted to keep up, and he was simply unable to provide the fairy tale life that existed in Josephine's head. The children, they grew up with very real issues and concerns, and these were all things Josephine preferred to pretend away like they didn't exist. Eventually, Bullion left, and Josephine was burdened with the full financial weight of Le Milan. She was able to keep it from being seized for four years, but by the fall of 1968, she and her family were evicted. Josephine's friend, Princess Grace Kelly of Monaco, arranged for Baker and her children to live in a villa near Monte Carlo. In the late 60s and 70s, Josephine suffered some health problems that kept her in and out of the hospital. But she was able to perform in a very well-received show about her life titled Josephine, and it was actually the 50th anniversary of her life in show business. The show opened in Paris in 1975, and the run closed with a 15-minute standing ovation. Her response to this overwhelming display of adoration was a flash of her famous smile and the simple words, Now I can die. Four days later, with rave reviews strewn about her, Josephine Baker experienced a stroke while she slept, and she fell into a coma that she never woke from. We can only hope her fairy tale dreams gave way to a happily ever after. 20,000 people attended her funeral, and the ceremony was broadcast on French national television, where a multitude of fans tuned in to say goodbye to their beloved Josephine the first American woman to receive full French military honors at her funeral, Josephine Baker packed the house in Paris one last time before being laid to rest in Monaco. Frida Josephine Baker was a daughter, a dreamer, a victim, a dancer, an overcomer, a performer, a lover, an activist, a fighter, a mother, a pilot a wife, an advocate, an idealist, and a legend. And she was a spy. If you like the show and would like to support us, 
You can do so in a number of ways. You can become a Patreon supporter. You can find us at Patreon under Spy Stories. You can tell your friends about our show. You can share our episodes. You can leave us positive reviews on iTunes. The extraordinary life of Josephine Baker reminds us there are terrible, terrible things in this world. And those of us with the means and the ability should rise up and fight those evils however we can. As Harriet the Spy says, life's a struggle. A good spy gets in there and fights. And until next week, keep fighting. So that is the story of Josephine Baker, Spy. Before we go, though, I did want to mention Josephine Baker's sexuality. I mean, this is a show about sex after all, right? And Baker, like James Bond, had plenty of action going on. But unlike Bond, she swung both ways, taking both male and female lovers. Would you call that a double agent of a sort? Anyway, Josephine Baker's female lovers included Clara Smith, Evelyn Shepard, and many others, and it was fairly common for entertainers of the time to go both ways. Fellow dancer Maud Russell Rutherford, aka Slim Princess, who worked with Baker, describes the common practice for showgirls of the day. Often we girls would share a room because of the cost. In the boarding houses of that time, they wouldn't let an unmarried man and woman room together. Well, many of us had been kind of abused by producers, directors, and leading men, if they liked girls. In those days, men only wanted what they wanted. They didn't care about pleasing girls. And girls needed tenderness. So we had girl friendships, the famous lady lovers. But lesbians weren't well accepted in show business. They were called bull dykers. I guess we were bisexual, is what you would call it today. And she says of Baker, I didn't think she was gay. She got around with too many men, but she didn't talk about those things. Hey, what you say, girl? And she was gone. So that was Josephine Baker, spy, lover, lady lover. Thanks for listening, everybody. Be sure to check out Karen and Chuck on Spy Stories, stories of the lives of spies throughout history. They've got tons of interesting episodes, like the one on the World War I dancer turned spy for the Germans, Mata Hari. Or how about the one on Roald Dahl? Yes, that Roald Dahl. He was not just the author of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and the creator of the beloved Willy Wonka character, but also a spy who supplied information to MI6, also a fighter pilot, believe it or not. It's a very interesting story, so be sure to check out Spy Stories for all that and more. Meanwhile, if you like what we're doing here on this show, you can support us by subscribing, rating, and reviewing. You can also pledge on Patreon, where $5 a month gets you a portrait in the time period and culture of your choosing. I will draw you mockingly giving jazz hands to the Fuhrer, or hiding a pistol in your banana skirt, or whatever you want. I'll make you look awesome, I promise. Just go to www.patreon.com slash btnewberg. That's patreon.com slash btnewberg. All right, folks, that's it for today. We'll be back next week with the new monthly theme. We're going to be exploring female anatomy and all the ways that men have managed to completely misunderstand it. As I'm sure you can imagine, there have been some doozies. That's coming up next. I'm B.T. Newberg, and this is the history of sex. Podcast theme music mixed from tracks by Kevin McLeod. For additional credits, references, photos, and more, see our website at www.historyofsexpod.com.